hey, look, let's come together. Let's find out what's working with conventional medicine because many things are. There's life-saving medications, life-saving advancements in, in surgery. Uh, let's get all the good stuff, but find out where there are gaps in chronic healthcare, like people struggling with these metabolic or autoimmune issues. And where can lifestyle medicine, where can functional medicine come in to be very effective without all the potential side effects that these very expensive interventions are having in some people's lives? That's Will Cole, a functional medicine expert. I'm your host, Patrick McGinnis, and this is FOMO Sapiens, part of the HBR Presents Network. Allow me to introduce myself. I'm the guy who invented the term FOMO. That's short for fear of missing out. Today, FOMO is an epidemic and is changing us so much that it sort of feels like we're evolving into a new species. But FOMO doesn't have to take over your life. You can find the power to choose what you actually want and the courage to miss out on the rest. I'll show you how right here on FOMO Sapiens. Welcome to FOMO Sapiens, the show where I interview people who are changing the world and ask them how they choose from among the many opportunities and options in their busy lives. When you live a full and busy life, it's easy to ignore your health as you struggle to fit more and more on your plate. But we've all seen it. One day, that person who seems to do it all suddenly crashes. And when your health suffers, you just have to stop and reset. Having learned that lesson the hard way myself, I invited Will Cole to join me today to talk about nutrition, taking care of yourself, and how to keep up the stamina and health to do the things you want to do in life. Will Cole was named one of the top 50 functional medicine and integrative medicine practitioners in the nation and is a health expert and course instructor for the world's largest wellness brands such as MindBodyGreen and Goop. He's the best-selling author of Ketotarian and the Inflammation Spectrum and host of the Goop Fellas podcast. Will Cole, welcome to FOMO Sapiens. The pleasure is all mine. Thanks for having me. It's my pleasure. Uh, I like to start the show the same way every time. So I have a question for you. Everyone feels a little FOMO sometimes. What turns you into a FOMO Sapiens? What turns me into a FOMO Sapien probably is when I am, I'm traveling for work and I see like my uh, FaceTime with my family and see like my wife and kids like doing something fun at home. I have this like pang of, oh man, I, I, I'm missing these moments with my kids. And I'm like, even though I love my work, but it's, it's something so like as a dad or a parent or whoever you are, it's just to have people that you love and not be there with them. It has, I definitely become a FOMO sapien then. So yeah, that's, that's the grand irony of all of these tools we have to communicate is that yes, they make us closer, more farther away, but then they, they provoke the FOMO in all of us. Well, I had you on the show today. The reason why I pinged you uh, to come on was because uh, a little while ago, last year, I started getting all these things in my inbox. There was a, a definition of the term JOMO or joy of missing out. Some of you may know that already, some of you may not, but it was spread around the internet and everybody sends it to me because when any FOMO, FOBO, JOMO, any of those references come up, my friends, my family, my parents send them to me. And so I got this definition of JOMO many times a day. And I decided to, I had to find out where it came from. And I realized it came from you. You posted this definition, which was then uh, reposted by Brene Brown. And of course that blew it up. I think you get like, I checked yesterday, sort of like 185,000 likes on that post right there. And so this definition that you posted, and I'll read it right now, is feeling content with staying in and disconnecting as a form of self-care. So I want to start because uh, we'll get into this in a little bit. You are a functional medicine doctor, so you think about these issues of how we live our lives. So what what brought you to to bring Jomo into all of our lives that day? Yeah, and I have to give a shout out to Brene Brown, my friend, for <laughs> a- amplifying the visibility of that for sure. Basically, when I wrote that post, it was just this this concept of a feeling like I always have to do all the things, right? And I I was a pure FOMO sapien of probably that that weekend. And just that I was sick of running around and having to kind of fill myself up with, with all the things I had to do. And I just wanted to relax on a weekend and be okay with just kind of detaching and unplugging and turning my phone off and being in the present moment uh, with my kids and my wife and myself. So yeah, that's really what it was. And I think that's the solution for our FOMO culture really is to find joy 
despite the fact that you're going to be missing out on things and that's okay. And I think that that seems maybe so simple, but in a very short period of time in human history, we went from living this more present moment to being very much connected, quote unquote, but really creating this sort of inner stress and anxiety and you know, dread about um, missing out or what that, what that would do um, to you both professionally and personally. So it's an interesting, it's an interesting concept. I really like it. And, and I, I think Jomo is one of these things where I, I have feel, a lot of feelings about it and I want to run them by you because this is, you're, you're seeing people all the time working with them as a doctor. So here's my take on Jomo. I like the concept. You know, I'm somebody who I try to meditate every day now, which I've seen a massive improvement in my mental and physical health since I've been doing it for the last year. Um, I try to be conscious about the decisions I make, all these sorts of things. And, and I think a lot of us have found that there's been this interesting tipping point where we've been so oversaturated the last couple of years with news all the time and with our devices that some people, many people are stepping away. At the same time, I think Jomo is one of these things. It's kind of a destination and it works really well for the smaller things in life. I think it's tougher when it comes to sort of like the big topics of life, like finding your purpose, finding your your love, sort of love of your life, finding that, that job that you want. And, and so I like it. I think it's a very good concept for people to latch onto, but I also um, don't see it as the cure-all for these topics as well. Thoughts? No, I would agree with that. It's not definitely not the cure-all, but I feel like it's almost we need to be more mindful of that simple thing that many people have lost focus of. And I think that's really that maybe the other side of joy missing out is that really when you're in joy in the present moment, you're really not missing out, you know, and, and you're right. That's not the solution for everything, but I think it's a, I see it as almost like a pointer or a mindfulness moment to recenter yourself when you are feeling that, that FOMO. Okay. That's good. I think we found the middle ground. The other reason I want to have you on the show uh, is because you have a really interesting new book coming out and it's about functional medicine and taking care of ourselves, which is so much a part of surviving in our crazy time. And um, I read it over the weekend. It, it's a really educational read. It's called The Inflammation Spectrum, Find Your Food Triggers, Reset Your System and Embrace Your Vibrant Health. And why I was interested in this topic is that I have seen the same thing happen to myself and others over time, which is that we think we can do everything. We are strong, successful people. We push ourselves to the edge. We are celebrated for being the hardest working, the most hardcore, the one who wants to stay out all night. And then one point comes along and you basically hit a wall. And this happened for me in 2008. I was working on Wall Street during the financial crisis. And basically one day I woke up, I couldn't get out of bed. I, I had night sweats. I had um, swollen glands. I went to the doctor. They couldn't feel out, figure out what's wrong with me. And I had this complete crash in my health. And it took me about six months to recover. I had blurry vision. I had all of these things happening. And that led to a fundamental series of changes in the way that I managed my health. And it really changed, I guess it took away that level of invincibility that I had about my health and, and how I felt. And I've seen this now with many of my friends. I have a friend right now who's going through exactly that, was in hospital, is now in a process of, of changing uh, diet, changing lifestyle. So this stuff is serious. And people, you know, they may poo-poo it until they're the one who gets sick. And all of a sudden you're throwing all of your time and all of your money at finding a solution because when you don't feel well, you can't do much of anything else. And so this is something that I know that you're dealing with every day. So tell us about what you do, what is functional medicine, and who are the kinds of people that you are working with? Our top patient base are people with autoimmunity or having you know some sort of autoimmune inflammation spectrum issue, which is kind of the topic of my second book, The Inflammation Spectrum, as you said, and uh, hormonal problems, neurological symptoms like brain fog and fatigue and anxiety and things like that, and digestive problems and inflammatory problems at large. It's really the commonality between so many things that we see clinically is inflammation, uh, chronic inflammation due to different reasons for sure. Uh, but it's my job to find out what's driving that inflammation and then also calming the inflammation itself. So what functional medicine is, is in short, it's evidence-based alternative medicine, but an extrapolated definition would be we interpret labs using a thinner reference range. So anybody that's listening is going to know when they get the labs done from their doctor, they have their number, 
And then they're being compared to this reference range is X to Y interval of numbers. That's largely based on a statistical bell curve average of people who go to labs. And people that go to labs are not the healthiest bunch of people. So there's a lot of people that want to find out, hey, that I'm having these symptoms. I don't feel well. I know intuitively there's something going on here. And the labs come back, quote unquote, normal, even though the person knows this isn't normal. And the doctor says, everything's fine. Like get, You're just depressed. Here's an antidepressant. Or you're just getting older. You need to, whatever, lose weight or something. There, there has to be a reason why you could be having symptoms despite normal labs. And it's normally something that you can't measure in a lab like depression or aging or weight loss resistance. So what they're unintentionally telling the patient is you're a lot like the other people with health problems that make up this reference range that you're being compared to. So in functional medicine, we're taking people with health problems out of that reference range. So we're comparing you, we're comparing the patient to optimal vibrant wellness. That's where your body is functioning the best. That's the functional range. And that's where we get our name functional medicine. Uh, so that's what we do. Uh, we run more comprehensive labs as well to look at these sort of underlying, what we call upstream issues, like what's driving these dysfunctions. Because we see the symptoms oftentimes as check engine lights. So the check engine lights on, but we have to look underneath the hood, proverbially speaking, and finding out what's imbalanced, what's dysfunctional, what's driving these symptoms. Uh, and so things like microbiome issues, toxicity, hormonal imbalances, nutritional deficiencies, et cetera. Based on a health history, we kind of find what labs are the most relevant. And then we realize we're all different. So there's not a cookie cutter, one size fits all approach to getting well. Uh, so we use food as medicine in a customized way. So we look at macros and micros and what's needed based on the labs. And we look at uh, natural medicine, like herbal botanical protocols based on labs and lifestyle modifications, stress management, movement, things like that, and medications when needed to really be tailored to the individual's labs and what moves the needle, what moves that lab data in a positive direction. So we're tracking things on spreadsheets and making sure the labs are, are moving in a, in a way of wellness. This is a space that I think people are starting to hear about, but maybe, maybe they're skeptical about, right? And I, I don't know if there's a tension between sort of traditional medicine and functional medicine, but how does that relationship go between, you know, going to see your primary care physician you've gone to for 25 years and then working with somebody like yourself? Is there a tension there? Do people work well together? Like how does a patient manage those two types of care? It's a great question. I don't believe there's any tension in it. I think that the commonality between us and conventional medicine is that we should be on the side of the patient and whatever moves the needle in the right direction. I'm not replacing Pete, their primary care doctor. Their primary care doctor stays the same. They're managing, they're, they're doing, doing their routine checkups. If they're managing medications, that's all happening with their PCP or endocrinologist or rheumatologist, whatever specialists are seeing. So that's not a replacement. We are giving a functional medicine perspective. We're giving them tools to work alongside it. Another word for functional medicine is integrative medicine. We're integrating all these parts. So it's not us versus them. Even though I think there are examples on both sides where they are at war, but there should be nothing at war because the only person that gets damaged at that point is the person struggling with health issues when they're already struggling. And the Cleveland Clinic has a functional medicine center. That's You can't get more mainstream and conventional than that. And that's the IF, IFM Institute of Functional Medicine, who's trained myself and my team and so many functional medicine doctors. So I most of my colleagues are actually conventionally trained. They're kind of doing the hybrid thing where they are in the conventional setting. They're in the hospital. They're in private practice in the insurance model, but they are also trained in functional medicine. So I, I don't see it as being us versus them. I think we have to rise to the occasion uh, because we look at the level of chronic health problems that we see uh, and we face as a society today we spend more on healthcare than the next 10 top spending countries combined, yet we have the most chronic disease. We have a really high, one of the highest infant mortality and maternal mortality rates in Western nations. We spend all this money. Most Americans are on at least one medication, many more on more than one medication, yet we have really not, not much to show for it. So we have to realize, hey, look, let's come together. Let's find out what's working with conventional medicine because many things are. There's life-saving medications, life-saving advancements in, in surgery. Uh, let's get all the good stuff, but find out where there are gaps in, in chronic health care, like people struggling with these metabolic or autoimmune issues, and where can lifestyle medicine, where can functional medicine come in to 
be very effective without all the potential side effects that these very expensive interventions are having in some people's lives. Yeah, because when you walk down the street in any city, and you'll take New York City, the, well, there are a lot of banks, and then there's a lot of drug stores. The solution for everything isn't just giving people more drugs. To me, that seems, I mean, it shouldn't be controversial, but at the same time, you, you mentioned in your book, I think, that nutrition is, is basically included in less than 20 hours in the typical medical student's agenda. So how does that all play in? Yeah, I think it's a reprioritization of what's being taught in medical school, I think, at first. And I think things will change with that because the efforts that the Cleveland Clinic and other mainstream institutions are having, uh, like giving integrative medicine and functional medicine a bigger role in their center, I think that, that the tri trickle-down effect will be more and more hours being devoted to nutrition. Because you look at the statistics of what's plaguing our society, and you look at diabetes, where 50% of the United States is insulin resistant to some degree, either prediabetes or metabolic syndrome or full-blown type 2 diabetes. And the levels of autoimmune conditions, like 50 million Americans have an autoimmune conditions, the rates of cancer and heart disease. So much of this can be, at the very least, very conservative estimate, dramatically improved with lifestyle in most cases. So, and if not more, I mean, they can, in many cases with diabetes, for example, you can reverse these things entirely with lifestyle changes. So the fact of the matter is we know it can make a dent. Lifestyle medicine can make a dent in, um, in these chronic diseases, but yet it's not really taught in conventional medical schools. I think we need to, again, rise to the occasion and realize, look, things have been done this way for the past uh, couple of decades, but we need to offer people better care in the conventional setting. Um, and people are yearning for it. I think that's part of the reason why you see the explosion of the wellness industry. You see the explosion of blogs and the explosion of podcasts because people are having to look outside of their conventional doctor's visit to get answers. Because being told there's nothing you can do here, like take this medication, see you in six months. You have a nation of a lot of them are very compliant patients, but yet they're still struggling. Uh, so they've had to take the reins themselves to be their own health advocate to get answers. And that's how they find people like myself and other functional medicine doctors around the country that are like, no, you're actually not crazy. There's the rate of statistics for these diseases are really high. We can measure these things on labs. This isn't just some concept where we're feeding into fear. Uh, these are disordered uh, physiological phenomenons and we can get you healthier at the very least, if not entirely healthy. Um, so I, I think that we have to do something different to see something different. It's like that definition of insanity. Uh, we have to kind of realize that what we're doing largely as a society with chronic health problems, not acute uh, health issues, is uh, not working for us. So I, that's definitely my, been my passion over the years of giving people giving them tools to find out why they feel the way that they do by running labs and then giving them action steps in their life to start improving their health. So let's, let's go through a typical day in your life. I'd love to hear how you, you know, somebody who shows up at your door or I, I guess on your, on your Skype and has some problems. What is the process you go through to figure out what's wrong? And then how might you address that through the lifestyle and the food and all the other things that you work with to make them better? Sure. So we start off with the consultation uh, with me. Uh, it's a very comprehensive consultation where we ha give them a, an application with tons of questionnaires that we've kind of formulated over the years. And we have some standardized ones that are used across the board in this space of functional medicine. And we're, the goal of that is almost to be a, a clinical Sherlock Holmes in a way. And we ask these obscure questions to the person. Like, why are they asking me about like the outer third of my eyebrows, for example? And other random questions like that, but they are pointers as to find out, okay, what's going on? So the outer third of your eyebrows could be a sign that your thyroid's not working well. And we ask very detailed questions about what are the, another word for functional medicine is systems medicine. What are the systems of the body that are, because our body is so brilliantly interconnected, what are the stones, so to speak, that are most likely to have something underneath it? So it all starts with a comprehensive health history. And that's like sort of the clinical data that we have to kind of look and formulate what the next step is. But there's also this present moment awareness that, you, that a good uh, practitioner has to have too, where 
it's the two sides of a coin of functional medicine, I think, is the science and then the art of it. So it's, yes, it's getting the data and, and, and being thought, uh, thoughtful from an intellectual standpoint, but it's also the space in between the words and what's the life of the person that you are interacting with. Uh, so it's, it's really important to hold space for that person and really be a healer in that way. And I don't mean, I just mean it from people just want to be heard at first. They want to be like, they've gone through a lot of heavy stuff oftentimes, and they just want to be heard and not brushed aside or like this God complex that many doctors can have without even knowing it. Uh, that, cause they are brilliant. They are smart and not realizing this person's really suffering and, and struggling and many times triggered because of the trauma that they've gone through. So that's where I spend about an hour, an hour and a half of them kind of going over that all the information and hearing them. And then we find out what labs are the most relevant. And then the way that I operate, obviously, because I'm primarily uh, remote, you know, via webcam, we're drop shipping the labs and coordinating those uh, specific labs that are the most relevant to their health history. And then we, once the lab information comes back, we're putting all the labs on spreadsheets, we're color coding them so they can see what's optimal, what's not optimal, and giving them a story as far as what their body's telling us. And these are the why they feel the way that they do largely, if not entirely. So we're looking at these pieces of the puzzle and then we lean into it with lifestyle changes. So the foods they eat will change based off of the labs. So it's just clinical nutrition really, but of really studying what foods would be the most appropriate, what way of eating, what preparation of foods would be the most appropriate, um, and uh, different natural medicine interventions. There may be a referral to a conventional doctor in addition to what we're doing with them too because of what we find. So it's really this integrative, collaborative experience between us, the patient, and whatever specialist in their hometown that we need to get them to. Well, This is the show about finding the power to choose what you actually want and the courage to miss out on the rest. You're talking with people all the time that are in, you know, crisis as it were. So what's your advice to our listeners if they're thinking about taking control of their health? Well, I think that to me, it's, it's realizing they have agency to do something about it because many people feel like this is, they don't even question it. So hopefully with the inflammation spectrum book, they can start to awaken to the fact that just because something's common doesn't make it normal necessarily. And we look at health problems, they are sadly ubiquitous, but we should not normalize them because these are things that are largely overcomable, improvable, healable things. Uh, so let's not settle for anything less uh, to at least move the health, their health as much as their body will allow in the right direction. So to be mindful and get in tune with your body of realizing that maybe feeling like fatigued and like living off of caffeine and sugar just to get through the day isn't normal. It's just common for you. Um, or that low grade anxiety or that digestive problem or those strange, maybe inflammatory symptoms that you're having are things that are not normal. They're just common. And you can start leaning into this world of functional medicine and wellness and just lifestyle changes to start feeling better. Um, so that's what I would say for people that want to start to ask those questions of, of what's going on with my body, check in with your body. Um, and we have a questionnaire in the book, a quiz actually, uh, that it's adapted from qu- questions that I ask patients. So I think people should take the a quiz and it's on the, my website too if people don't want to get the book but it's at drwillcole.com so just be in tune with your body and see what systems may be not optim- optimal for themselves yeah and pay attention because a lot of times the, the health problems that people have later on they start to see at a certain point and they ignore them and because it, it feels better to ignore than to deal with it but the problem is if you do that one day you wake up I mean I think we've all everybody who's listening to this show has done that at some point in their life or they've seen somebody do that and you know I'm no I'm no different and so um, you know it's something that that I, I wanted to get this on the show and talk about this because what I see so much in the people around me and all the FOMO sapiens is that we drive ourselves into the ground and then you know then we regret and you know there's nothing worse than regretting things that could have been prevented earlier on. Totally. And you look at the level of chronic health problems out there. They don't happen overnight. They exist on a spectrum as I talk about this inflammation spectrum. It's about seven to 10 years prior to when it's someone's diagnosable, things were brewing. That inflammation storm was brewing about seven to 10 years prior. So that's in a way sobering, but in a way there's that grace period of realizing, look, 
we don't have to go down that road largely. There's so much we can do. We can't control everything. Obviously, there are people that do all the things and bad things happen to them, but there's, we can wield so much influence in most cases to start reclaiming our health and not just settling for feeling lousy because it's so easy being busy and running ourselves in the ground to not be conscious and pay attention to our health. Our body is giving ourselves check engine lights, pay attention. Uh, because these are things that oftentimes only you will notice. So you have to be your own health advocate to start um, to move your health in a positive direction. Excellent. Uh, will you, uh, you're a busy guy. You've got a book coming out. You have uh, the Goop Fellows podcast. You've got tons of patients. You're probably traveling around all the country. So as you do this work that you do and get busier and busier, what are you missing out on? Good question. Um, I'm missing out on more time with my kids. Um, I'm mindful of that. So I, my solution, which isn't a perfect solution, is I take them with one of them with me. I have two kids. I take either my son or my daughter with me when I have a work and I travel for work. I, I make one of them come with me. So because I'm mindful of, I'm missing about missing out on many moments, and I have that dad guilt that I'm trying to find that balance. And you're getting them tons of frequent flyer miles, so that when they hit 18, they can go to Europe. <laughs> awesome. And so, so it's been really fun having you on today. Where can uh, our listeners find out more about you? Yeah. Thanks again for having me. Uh, everything's at drwillcole.com. That's D-R-W-I-L-L-C-O-L-E.com. Yeah. So all the stuff's there. All right. Dr. Will Cole, thanks for joining. Thanks for having me. FOMO. And now it's time for the FOMO moment of the show, which is when I talk about FOMO and its role in pop culture or tell you about something that's giving me FOMO. And today I want to talk about ghosting. If you're not familiar with the term, let me define it for you. According to the Oxford Dictionary, ghosting is the practice of ending a personal relationship with someone by suddenly and without explanation withdrawing from all communication. Now, I did a little research and I found out that ghosting is very prominent in the world of celebrity dating. Some great examples of this are when Rihanna ghosted Drake. And more recently in 2019, apparently Heidi Klum also ghosted Drake. So Drake is an expert in ghosting. Drake, if you're listening to this, love to have you on the show. But here's the thing, ghosting is no longer just for the world of dating, it has also infiltrated the world of work. The company Indeed, which is in the recruiting space, found that a whopping 83% of employers had experienced ghosting from their applicants. 40% of those applicants ghosted because they got a better offer, which is quite interesting because if you think about FOBO, fear of a better option, that's really what's fueling this. And here's another aspect of this that I find kind of interesting. Anybody who's ever interviewed for a job has probably been ghosted by an employer. It has been a one-sided thing and now it's turning back around and I guess the candidates are getting their revenge. But no matter how you cut it, ghosting isn't okay. It really degrades the entire relationship between employers and applicants, and it makes it even harder to find a job because while you're ghosting somebody, they're holding that position open and maybe could give it to somebody else. So I like to think about the golden rule, treat people as you would like to be treated yourself. Nobody wants to be ghosted. So applicants and employers, stop the ghosting. FOMO. Big news. You can now pre-order my upcoming book, Fear of Missing Out, Practical Decision Making in a World of Overwhelming Choice at patrickmcginnis.com slash FOMO Sapiens. While you're there, make sure to download my free gift for you, the FOMO Sapiens Handbook, which is an exclusive guide to spotting and managing FOMO and even turning it into a force for good. And as always, if you have an idea for the FOMO moment of the show, you can reach me on Twitter at PJ McGinnis, on Instagram at Patrick J. McGinnis, or on email at letsconnect at patrickmcginnis.com. FOMO Sapiens is part of the HBR Presents Network. The show is produced by AW360 and recorded in New York City. Theme music is by Mike McGinnis. If you like today's show, please be sure to subscribe, rate it, and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me at patrickmcginnis.com. You can also take the official FOMO diagnostic at patrickmcginnis.com slash FOMO dash quiz to find out if you're a FOMO Sapiens. FOMO. 